right, guys. Welcome to another edition of Texans Unfiltered. Uh, we are blessed to be joined by Antonio Cromartie. David, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to uh, talk with me today. I'm super excited to talk to you. I see a potential cornerback one. I uh, can move very well. Very does very well, can play man to man very well. I think that he is a better quarterback than Patrick Mahomes. He does things that are so amazing, and the competitor in him is just special. Um, I'm excited, man, and I I can't wait to get there. I think it does really fit my skill set. All right, welcome everyone to Texans Unfilter. Can y'all hear me this week? <laughs> Everybody hear me this week. I hope y'all can. I just bought a new mic. I do apologize for last week. It was kind of crazy, but it is what it is. All right, well, very first thing we're going to start off is Janice McNair. Can Janice McNair help us out? Because obviously Cal, Cal is absolutely lost. Um, we've got John V, our intern. We've got the famous Pat Storm here with us tonight. And we're going to talk this out. Can Janice McNair help us? Pat, what have you discovered? So I kind of, I stumbled across this earlier. Um, a lot of people know this guy, Michael Schwab on Twitter. He's a huge Astros guy. Um, and we've done some talking with him. And so earlier this week, he tweeted something out. He tweeted out a link that the Cron um, had published. And it had to do with uh, a guy by the name of Kirby John Caldwell. And so Michael, being the guy that he is, he does a little bit of looking. And he sees this guy's name pop up as part of the ownership group of the Texans. Well, Kirby John is a pastor. Um, he's been a personal advisor to Barack Obama, to George Bush. So you would think this guy should be like a saint, right? Well, Kirby John was just convicted to six years in prison for defrauding people of over $4 million. Um, so I got to thinking, well, let's see what other dirt I can find. Well, Ken Lay, for anybody that's old enough to remember the Enron scandal, was the chairman and the founder of all that's of, of Enron. And he was one of the original investors for the team. Another shady fella. Well, there's another guy that has to do with the team. And let's see, his name is Javier Loya. Javier is a minority owner for the team. And now he is being sued by his business partners for basically stealing from the company um, to the tune of over, what, $2 million, $2.7 million um, for fraudulent expenses on a company credit card. Anywhere from, you know, a $17,000 birthday party for his daughter, um, $4,000 dinners constantly, multiple times a week. Um, so to me, this just screams that these people are dealing with some shady individuals and they have been for years. And it just, to me, it screams that even when it comes to the team and when it comes to business, they have zero idea what they're doing. And that scares me because right now this team is in crisis um, this business is in crisis and they don't know how to handle it. Cal doesn't know how to handle it. And I don't, for, to be kind, I, I don't think a lot of this has to do with Janice just because she, you know, this kind of just fell in her lap when Bob passed away. Right. Um, this isn't something she asked for. This isn't, you know, she's not the one that started the team and brought football back to Houston. So I, I honestly don't think she knows how to handle it just from a sense that this isn't what she was, you know, this isn't her expertise. So I think the best thing to do right now and the best thing that Janice can do would either be remove Cal from his position or sell the team. Yeah, that's a, 
that's a thing that's a, that we really do need to kind of stress. Cal does not own the team. Cal is the CEO. He was groomed to be the CEO. However, it is very, very common within the NFL for the owner not to be the CEO of the team. Like that is incredibly common. This is a different situation. Um, Cal was Cal was groomed by Bob McNair to take over the team. Granted, it was kind of like a protective grooming because let's be honest, Cal Cal's not the guy. He's not for all all the faults that Bob McNair had. Cal is nothing like his father. Um, the good or the bad, apparently, at this point. And he is a CEO, and a CEO can actually be fired. Now, granted, I don't know if Janice will actually will actually fire her own son, but is there any sort of, I mean, granted, this whole group sounds like a bunch of criminals and crooks anyways, but is there any hope that, that among these criminals and crooks, they have enough power to override Janice and remove Cal as CEO, or does Janice have complete protection as controlling owner. Yeah. She can't be overrun. As far as I know, unless there's, unless they have a board type of situation, which I'm not aware of. Um, I've been doing all sorts of looking. I can't find anything on it. I can't find like a definitive structure if they operate like a, a normal corporation. Um, so, I, I mean, I think Janice could absolutely fire him not fire him, but they would remove him, have him step down, have somebody else take over. Cal does have a, a, he does have a younger brother that could take over. Um, he's been a successful businessman of his own. He runs, um, he runs a very successful company, something like two point something billion dollars in investments. So I think, uh, that would probably be the way they go if they don't sell the team. Um, if they were to remove Cal. Yeah, uh, Robert McNair Jr. He goes by his middle name, but I'm blanking Carrie. on his middle name right now. I'm Carrie. sorry. Carrie. Carrie. Uh, Robert Carrie McNair. There we go. Uh, Carrie McNair, actually, he's been kind of independent. Um, mm -hmm. My joke about it a couple of years ago when we kind of talked about it was Carrie is fine on his own, so his dad didn't baby him. Everybody can kind of, kind of feared Cal taking over in some regards um, just because I mean, look at it. Um, I believe that they were hoping that the Texans would be set up under football individuals and they would just let him run. The football guys just run the team. And all this crap about the Texans not being a well-run organization. I mean, it's under Bob, we had our issues, but the team was professionally ran and it was respectively ran. It wasn't this clown show. Were they too slow to fire people? Yeah, they were too loyal. They've always been too loyal. But Bob McNair set out having a mission of wanting to be like the Steelers. He wanted to be like the Cowboys. He wanted to be a brand that had, that just signified stability. That's why we don't get uniforms every year. That's why we have the same uniforms from day one. Is That's what they were looking for, that, sta that stability. Granted, Cal comes in. What was it? Six months after assuming complete control, let's build. Um, Brian Gaines gone, like just there you go. Doesn't let him, you know, establish himself at all. Just cuts the rug out. And the rumor at that point, like apparently the positivity behind that was Cal was going to be more of a decision maker than his father. He was going to be aggressive. He wasn't going to let things sit in Stewart. Well, it kind of turns out it might have been for other reasons that we'll kind of talk about here a little bit later on on the podcast all right next thing up we really don't want to talk about this i'm going to be so tired about talking about this yesterday it seemed like things were kind of you know warming up deshaun didn't seem so bad and then i wake up this morning and lance Zierlein, who everybody knows in houston lance very well respected he is right more than he is wrong tweets out and it wasn't the main part of the tweet but it was a response to the tweet that Pretty soon, Deshaun Watson is going to request to be traded. Are we? Are we? Are we panicking? Like, are we threatening to become making plans on becoming a Cowboys podcast? Like, what's our level of panic at this point? I'm pretty panicked, actually. 
last night I was not so panicked about it. I was like, oh, everything's going to be fine. Um, I was pretty solid confident that Deshaun Watson will be staying in Houston. But after seeing that tweet, I keep changing my mind about what's going to happen. I don't know how to feel anymore about Deshaun Watson staying or requesting a trade. Um, I don't want to believe anything I see on the internet. I guess the only thing that I'll speak about or even believe is that when I actually see that Deshaun Watson has officially requested a trade. I'm kind of tired of all these speculations and rumors going on. And I'm pretty sure that's how both you and Pat feel, but that's how I feel on that. Pat, can you make me feel better? Man, I'm honestly at the point where <clears throat> I have removed all emotion from it because you've got one guy saying one thing, one guy saying another, yep. she's saying something, he's saying another, um, nothing coming directly from Deshaun, nothing coming directly from David Mulageta, nothing directly from the team. Mm -hmm. So there's, because of the magnitude of his status, one with the team and in the league, it's going to be the biggest story of the off season, regardless of what else happens. Um, and so we just got to be prepared that it could go one way that we all are going to hate, um, but it could go the complete opposite direction and they could reconcile everything with them, uh, get them on board with whoever they hire as a head coach. And, you know, everything's honky dory come September when the season starts. So it's one of those things right now. I just, I don't care. I'm I'm tired of stressing over it because yeah. it's not going to benefit me in any way. I can't get, I've asked multiple people on both sides and nobody can give you a straight answer. Nobody from the team can give you a straight answer. Nobody from the local media can give you a straight answer. Nobody from his camp will give you a straight answer, but I get it because nobody really knows. They don't have a head coach yet. So of course, Nobody knows how this is really going to go. Yep. And I think we're also tired of um, talking about negative things on Deshaun Watson. Oh, definitely. And I mean, here's the truth. We won't be a Cowboys podcast. We'll talk Spider-Man or something. Like, let's be, let's be real. Like, football will be over in Houston. We won't even know what the NFL is within the entire city. Well, I mean, and here's the other thing. Like, it keeps being brought up that look at what – Jalen Ramsey was able to force himself out of Jacksonville. Um, that was the the comparison, especially because him and Deshaun share the same agent. Yeah. And then DeAndre Hopkins was able to force himself out of Houston. Force, in quotations. Because he said he knew he was going to be traded, but he didn't really ask for a trade. He just knew how to put it in motion because the Texans wanted to trade him. And I even think that with the Jaguars, they wanted to get rid of Jalen because they knew they were going to rebuild. The Texans don't want to get rid of Deshaun. Like, I don't, honestly, like, it's the NFL. We've talked about it before, especially if you look at the most recent um, collective bargaining agreement. The players gave up all their power. The only thing Deshaun can do is not play. And if he doesn't play, the Texans don't have to pay him, and he does not accrue a season on his contract. Now, Pat, you just jumped back in. Am I wrong on something about that? And what am I missing here? No, you're 100% right. He sits out, doesn't accrue the year on his contract, so he would still be under contract for five years. He loses money every day that he's out of training camp, um, and the team could find him additionally on top of that. So, plus he doesn't get paid. They've already paid out all his bonus money, the 27 point whatever it was. So, I mean, he sits out, he's getting absolutely nothing. So I see... Reggie Bush and a few other people saying that he's got leverage. In my opinion, he really doesn't unless he's willing to forego this stuff to really push, push the issue. I mean, the only leverage he has is if they send him to, I don't know, what's the worst team he could possibly be sent to Jacksonville. Maybe he could veto that he can veto yeah. the location he goes, but he can't force the Texans to trade him. He can just refuse to play which there is a difference. True. And honestly, if Deshaun sits out next season, I'd still want to fire McNair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, John. 
you were at the yeah. uh, you were at the ro- the uh, rally yesterday. Um, can you kind of tell us a, a little bit about that? What was the intent? How many people showed up? Even though Deshaun tweeted it out um, for people not to show, just what your overall experience was. Yeah. So um, there were I. If I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna say at least. 200 people at the rally um i was driving down um i was over by the light before nrg and i saw tons of texans fans all um decked out in watson merch and they all had um on their on the back of their jersey they said save watson and people were people were fired up i'm telling you texans fans are not happy um everybody was people just wanted to be there and show their support for deshaun watson that was there. That was the whole message of this whole thing to save Deshaun Watson and bring a winning positive culture change back to Houston. That was the whole intent of this rally. People were peaceful. They did their job. Whenever Deshaun Watson tweeted out that he would like people to go home just because of COVID. And then whenever we put out a statement on our social media saying you guys should go home be- because Watson said so, people went home. And that was the most important and I guess stressful part of the whole thing was making sure people go home. So people were people were angry. We don't want to be in the situation. We never expected to be in the situation. I mean, if you told us a year from now, a year ago, if you told us that we would be in the situation, we would have laughed in your face and said, There's no way. Yeah, that is beyond depressing that this was even thought of. Like Again, another strike against Cal McNair. How on earth do you take a time when we were supposed to be the most optimistic we've been in years? We have a franchise quarterback that, again, the deeper you look at Deshaun's numbers, the better he did. Yeah. We're going to get a new coach. We're going to get a new GM. Hope springs eternal. Uh, Jamie Roots apparently had texted back to somebody like, hope springs eternal. All the bad guys are gone. Um, and right now, it, we don't feel hopeful. Like I dread waking up in the morning. I dread going on Twitter right now. Yes. And I think that if Deshaun Watson didn't tweet anything, I th- I feel like we would have had a bigger turnout. All right. Uh, shout out to Houston Texans talk for, uh, for the donation. Um, let's see. Well, Pat, how just overall right now with everything with Deshaun, I know you're numb to it. If you had to make a definitive answer, what do you think is going to happen? Put me on the spot. <clears throat> Personally, I don't think they'll trade him. Just for the simple fact that I don't see that being the first move or in the first year of Nick Casario's tenure being something that he does. It would be a stain on him. It'd be a stain on the franchise. Um, and it could be a crippling one, regardless of the return they get back. They could go out and get six first round draft picks. They could trade him to the Jets, get four draft ra- draft picks for him this year and two next year, and it would still suck because this team waited 17 years to find Deshaun Watson. So unless you're getting back 17 first round draft picks, it's not worth it. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. He's a generational talent. He led the league in passing year this year. He led the league in a number of categories this year. And I, I understand he's unhappy, and I get it. I can appreciate that. But I think cooler heads need to prevail on this. I think everybody needs to be professional about it. And they need to get him in a room, get him on a Zoom call, get him on a phone call, stop texting him, call him. Call him until he answers. Call his agent until he calls you back. Yeah. Don't stop. Be relentless in the pursuit of getting him to be happy. Because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that's going to save this team. This team won four games with Deshaun Watson this year. Imagine what they'll do next year without him. Yes. I understand they have a little bit easier schedule next year, but there's no way. Like, yeah, they could draft Trevor Lawrence. They could draft Josh Fields. None of those guys are Deshaun Watson. They are not a proven NFL quarterback. So I don't think they'll trade him just because, one, it doesn't make business sense. 
Two, it doesn't make logical sense. And three, it doesn't make football sense. Traded a quarterback like Deshaun Watson. So there's this argument out there that top three quarterbacks, uh, Deshaun is one of them. The other two are Pat Mahomes and Russell Wilson, right? Or is there somebody else that's number three night right now? I have to go Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I'm going to go with Aaron Rodgers. So we go with those four guys regardless. And I'd like to point this out to everybody that's saying trade for a number one pick. Which one of those four were a number one pick? The answer is none of them. Yeah. I mean, that's how hard it is to get a top quarterback. Now, if we start going down the list on the top 10, I think maybe, maybe two guys were actually number one picks. Um, Let's see. Tyler Murray was a number one pick. Do you consider him a top 10? No. If you play fantasy. He's French. He's close. He's close. Baker Mayfield. No. <laughs> God, no. Oh, no. All right. Um, so we've got right now we're up at. I, I can't even I can't even think of like the next one. Um, Jared Goff. No, absolutely not. Like I, I, I can't even ask that. And who's who's another quarterback out there that was a number one overall? Like a first round? First round. Carson, Carson Wentz, Wentz was number two. He's definitely not it. He's nope. fallen off a cliff. Tua? Nope. Um, I'm going trying overall. to go down the list. Cam Newton? Nope. Um, I mean, a long time ago. I mean, mm. but I'm saying currently playing. Like, that's why it's so hard to put it together. Jameis Winston, he's playing, but no. Lamar Miller. Or Lamar Jackson was at the end of the first round. Everybody passed on him, including the Ravens. The Ravens got mm-hmm. him with their second first round pick. Yeah. So again, the whole point, uh, Joe Burrow, maybe. I mean, he doesn't have a knee more. Maybe yeah, we're out on Joe Burrow. Him. We don't know yet. I mean, he's still not on the same, he's still not at the same level. Like, you don't give up a quarterback like Deshaun Watson. There is no way to predict how you could get another Deshaun Watson. And it doesn't matter how many draft picks you get back to do so. You have to get enough draft picks to build a team like the early 2010 Texans. And you saw what that was like. If we had a quarterback like Deshaun Watson for any of those years, we have a super. They almost, they could have won it with Matt Schaub. They almost won one with Matt Schaub. If yeah. it stayed healthy. Matt doesn't get hurt. Matt Schaub doesn't get hurt. They win it. I mean, it's you have to build a team that perfect, though. How do you luck into having a team that is that loaded ever again? Like, go look back at, at 20, it's 2013, correct? Um, 2011 or 2013. I always get it confused. But that team is absolutely loaded, stacked from top to bottom. This is when you have Arian Foster at his peak, Andre Johnson at his peak. You have a defense that has a rookie JJ Watt. So it's 2011. We have cornerbacks, we have safety play. Like, that team is the best football team that we're probably going to see in our lifetime, and they didn't have a quarterback. And I would take a Deshaun Watson-led team with half that amount of talent versus that team with no talent. Yeah. If Deshaun had a decent defense this year, they're a 9-7 and team. Yes. Easily. And to speak to the level of talent that Deshaun Watson has, sorry to cut you off, but when he was drafted that year, the Seahawks already had their quarterback, right? They already had Russell Wilson. They had already been great with Russell Wilson. Deshaun Watson was the second player on their board, on their draft board. He was the second rated player on their draft board, and they already had their franchise quarterback. That's how good this kid is. You can't trade him regardless of the return. It's just not possible. It's possible, but it's stupid. And around the 2017 draft, Dabo Sweeney said that any team that trades or passes on to Sean Watson is passing on the NFL's version of Michael Jordan. So imagine if we traded to Sean Watson. I mean, that's easily the, wor- the worst moment in Houston sports. Yeah. Deshaun may want to leave, and I would hate it, but hopefully things like, you know, the Raleigh that people said was – they got some hate and got a lot of love. Things like that prove that, you know, Cal McNair is one person, 
there's millions of others that absolutely love him. And I know he just wants to win a Super Bowl. We want we want it to. We definitely want it to, man. All right. Next thing up. I can't believe people have asked me this. Why does everybody hate this bald man? People actually texted me after the last show. Why do we call him joke? Why does a whole fan base hate this man so much? And even in perspective, I don't think they even realize it up in New England. Um, Matt Slater, Matthew Slater, Provo special teams player. This is the quote that he said when Easterby left. Man, I hope one day, and I hope and pray to be half the man that Jack's been and impact the lives in the way that he has. This was when he left New England. Matthew Slater, pretty well-respected player in the entire NFL. That's a pretty big statement. Half the man of this guy? So now we have Jack Easterby. Why does everybody in Houston hate this man? Where do I start? Because since he's been here, there's been no good stuff that's happened. Right? He gets here, Jadavian Clowney gets traded. The next year, I'm sorry, two years later, whatever it was, DeAndre Hopkins is traded. They fired J.J. Moses. They fired Amy Palsik. They've got Jamie Roots, who has resigned, wants to leave, um, and they're somehow keeping him in the building. You've got Brian Gain gets fired, and then they fumble the Nick Casario hire the first time. They fumble it the second time because the Patriots say no. Um, I mean, it's just been everything that could possibly go wrong has gone wrong for this team. And everything keeps going back to him. His name always comes up on it. And I understand some people say that he's not behind all of it. They're so full of crap. If Andre Johnson speaks out about it, something is wrong. That man was in the building with Jack Easterby. He was in the building with the players. He talks to a lot of these players still. If he's telling you there's something wrong with Jack Easterby, you got to look and you got to figure it out because you're going to lose the team pretty fast. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things though, that that Jack did is you notice how the Texans and Bill O'Brien went from being a player's team with JJ Moses to letting go of JJ Moses and then kind of flipping the culture. He wanted Bill O'Brien to have the players feel like they were walking on eggshells. That's an actual quote. That, that was the change after J.J. Bill O'Brien went from being approachable to having the players feel like they're walking on eggshells. Why? And players aren't idiots. Jack wanted to be the vacuum. He wanted to play that same role that he played in New England, where no one talks mm -hmm. to Belichick. Belichick is a god walking amongst people there. But Jack Easterby was the guy everybody could go to. That was his role, and he was trying to recreate it down in Houston. We have talked over and over and over. Whenever you try and copy anything that is done in New England, it leads to disaster. Jack was creating a divisive environment from day one because he had convinced everybody to kind of flip how they act so he could be their go-to. Um, this was in 2019. Other things that y'all may have forgotten, especially if you listened to the show and you weren't aware of it, um, Jack was a part of the tampering charges when they originally tried to hire Nick Casario. He goes to the ring ceremony in New England. The next day, Brian, literally the next day, Brian Gain is fired. Two days later, it leaks out that the Texans are going after Nick Casario. Like they interviewed one other guy and then they're going after Nick Casario. Like it, these plots aren't even. They're not even complex. Like they don't even do a good job of hiding their intentions. Anybody from the outside could have definitely felt it or seen it. It doesn't matter what they come out after the fact and try and defend them. The next thing was DeAndre Hopkins, of course, being traded. And part of the reason why it was so urgent that you traded him was the cultural thing. And it leaks out that it was because of baby mamas. Let's be real. Bill O'Brien didn't care. He has one. He has one baby mama. One. Yeah. And they say baby mamas. They don't even know their players. Yeah, that's 
Easterby's fingerprints are all over it because Bill O'Brien isn't going to suddenly flip on a player, especially when he defended that player so definitively when Brock Osweiler crashed and burned. And you remember D-Hop at that point tweeted out, that's my coach. What causes that 180 from when D-Hop goes, that's my coach, to him being traded and them talking about off-the-field issues? One person came into the building. So, again, this stuff is not hard to follow if you pay attention. Like, it should be fairly common knowledge. But I guess we were wrong, and we were assuming that it was common knowledge, and that's why we're just re restating it. I know a lot of y'all guys in chat, y'all are awesome. Y'all pay as much attention to the Texans, if not more so than we do. I know there are several people in the chat that know way more about the Texans than I do. And y'all knew all this, but you'd be surprised. A lot of people out there, they don't. But again, Jack Easterby comes into the building, strange things happen. The last thing that I really want to point out is part of the reason that Brian Gain and Bill O'Brien had a split is Brian Gain seriously wanted to trade Clowney. Bill O'Brien didn't. Gain leaves. Easterby gets a more prominent role. All of a sudden, Clowney is not a cultural fit. And he's traded. So granted, that one may have walked out, worked out. We got the goat. But again, it's another common thread. Did I, did I miss any? Or is there any other big issues that, other than, you know, potentially stalking players? Like, that one's, pretty, that one's pretty big, too. Like, that was one of the accusations in the SI article, if you didn't read it, the Sports Illustrated article. Three players believe that he had people follow them home. It's crazy <clears throat> to think that you're, you know, an athlete, a grown man. And yeah, you have to deal with NFL security from time to time, you know. Um, but if you're staying out of trouble and you're not being, you know, you're not being a disruption, why are you being followed? I don't understand it. What is it that these people... Like these people have an issue. If they can't trust the players, cut them. If you don't trust them, cut them or trade them. You don't follow them. They're grown men. All right. You're not, they're not cheating on you. They're not stealing from you. They're playing football for you. You don't have them followed. It's ridiculous. Well, what this screams to me, and we're gonna, and it's gonna kind of segue into our next section, is Jack Easterby apparently had some sort of, of roster control. Very little bit. He was apparently in, on, and when I say that, I mean he was in on the discussion. It doesn't mean that he got final say. If he's having people followed, he is looking for dirt on them, so he can tell the whomever's making the decisions to trade them to trade them. That's what it screams to me. Is my theory way off base? I mean, I don't know, because I know one of them is not on the team anymore because he has to leave. That's, yeah, just sad. All right, well, I'm going to bring you to my original title card for this episode because Texans Twitter had me, had even me all excited. I was like, is EB going to happen? Is Eric Bieniemy going to be our next head coach? That's what was going on yesterday. That was going on from people that we are well connected with, um, including um, James, the founder of Texans Unfiltered. He was one of the original people that leaked it out there. There was a lot of smoke. And now it's kind of gone away. Um, so what do we think? Is this happening? Are we going to get excited? Are we going to be meh? Like, what's going on? Well, John V, I'll let you answer first. What do you, what do you think? If we get EB, are you happy? Yes, I'm super happy. I'm trying not to get too excited right now since we haven't heard anything today at all, which I'm not really taking as a good sign. Last night, I was pretty happy about it. Um, do I still think we're getting, we could get the enemy? Yes, but I just kind of want to tell everyone, don't get excited. We're still Texans fans. We've been disappointed. You might want to prepare for disappointment. Yeah. I, 
there was a lot of smoke, right? And I think the fact that Nick pushed so hard to get the NFL to change the rule kind of speaks to how much they want him. Um, you don't you don't approach the NFL about changing a rule that's been in, in play for forever. It's the way you can interview somebody. And so I think that culminated with what we know the players have said, what we know how Deshaun has spoken about him, um, how Justin Reed has spoken about him, how Andy Reed has spoken about him, how everybody around the league thinks this guy needs to be a head coach. And I agree. I truly do believe he needs to be a head coach. Um, I'm prepared to be let down because from the beginning, I've said they're going to screw this whole thing up. So I'm not, I'm not getting my hopes up for him to be the, the head coach. I would absolutely love it. Um, and, but the simple fact that we hear just tonight from somebody that's pretty well connected in the NFL, that he had a really good interview. Um, we had heard that yesterday also that they were kind of discussing terms as far as roster control, stuff like that leads me to think that this thing has some pretty good traction, but I'm not going to discount Leslie Frazier and all this just because of all the connections, right? Leslie Frazier and David Culley have all worked together. And so has Eric Bannemi. So there's a lot going on here, but also the fact that Jack, Nick and Leslie all share the same agent. I'm not counting that out just for the simple fact of how we know Nick ended up getting the job. Yeah. So. So if we do get the enemy, are you happy? Yeah. Yeah. I think is, he, he wanted... would he be a disappointment? is he what? Would he be a disappointment? Because I know there's a lot of people that were not very high on the B enemy train. There's a lot of people out there that still want Brady. And I can pretty much tell you Brady's not happening. I mean, it's one of those things. Not everybody was going to be happy at the end of the end of the end of the day with this situation. You were going to have people that were still upset because they had their guy that they liked, and you couldn't tell them anything. They were dead set on who their person was. I think people having an open mind that are looking for somebody that's competent, that the players are going to get behind, that the players are going to want to play for, and he's going to hold them accountable. Like I don't understand how you can get upset at that. Now. Granted, he may come in and in four years he gets fired because they go four and 12 again. But that's fine by me. They took the chance on somebody that we know has been successful before, who's won a Super Bowl, who's on the verge of winning another one. And by all accounts, he's been an integral part of it. So, like, what do you have to lose? So what? He doesn't work out. Give it a shot. You don't know until you try. I'm tired of playing it safe. I'm tired of the safe hire. Bill O'Brien was a safe hire. Gary Kubiak was a safe hire. Dom Capers was a safe hire. I'm tired of being safe. Go out there, make a splash, and do something. Well, that's one thing that I've always been confused on. How is BNM not a safe hire? I think he's safe, but he's also that splash. Like, he's that flash in a pan. And somebody made the, the point earlier today. Kevin Stefanski was the very last coach hired last year. And he just led the Browns to the playoffs. And he's a very good candidate for coach of the year. And he was not really the safe hire. He was kind of an out-of-the-box out thinking hire. But I think that's where this goes. I think that's the enemy. I truly do. I truly think that if you hire him, he can help. Maybe not next year. He can turn this team around in a few years and get them back and be super competitive. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in an agreement. I think Bienemy, again, the biggest selling point from Bienemy or me from the beginning was the players wanted him. And with all the dysfunction we have right now, I think that that is a huge, huge, huge thing. Players that want to play for him. Again, I said it last week and I'll, maybe it was last week, it might have been on Texans Thoughts um, on his show, that part of the reason that Bill O'Brien was able to get underperforming teams to perform as well as they did is he had the locker room on his side. 
they never broke. That was always the most impressive thing about Bill O'Brien, no matter how bad his temper was, that the team never quit on him until this year. And, well, we can always discuss why they quit on him this year because we just did. But for bien he has those points. Like, I don't care what offense he brings in. I don't care if he's not the play caller in Kansas City. Does he get the players that want to play? And does he hold his coaches accountable when they can't play? Can he identify solid, a solid coaching staff? And everybody under the under the Andy Reid tree does have that same trait. They hire qualified coaches. They don't hire their friends. They hire guys that can coach. That's pretty universal. So, yeah, those were my two two big points on BNME. I would be over the moon. He was always my 1A, 1B um, between him and Salah. And, of course, we can't hire Salah now. So, you know what? BNME, I think he can do it, and I think we should be over the moon. And seeing as how I want it done, that means it's not going to happen. So we're going to have Leslie Frazier as our next head coach because, you know, that is how it goes in Houston. If that happens on a level of 1 to 10, how devastated are we if we're Leslie Fa- led by Leslie Frazier? I'm at a 9. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Because you could have had Matt Eberflus. Yes. I'd take Eberflus over Frazier. For sure. 100%. Why is I that? would be impressed if we got Frazier. One, because we've seen what Frazier's done as a head coach, right? Have we? I mean, um, his quarterback was Christian Ponder. The best thing Christian Ponder ever did was marry Samantha Steele. Look what Eric Bianami just did last weekend with Chad Henney. That was one. That was I know it's kind of like an unfair situation, right? Like that's it's different. Chris Ponder was his his quarterback. I know. I just I don't want to retread. Like regardless of the respect he has, and people talk really highly of him. Um, I just I don't. I just I can't accept it. We didn't go through all this. Your players can't be this upset. And you go and hire Leslie Frazier. It's that doesn't make any sense. John V, where are you at a nine? I don't think I don't think Frazier's ready to be a head coach yet. I don't see enough I don't okay. I don't see enough promise in him. And I don't think players want to play for Frazier. Really? Yes. Have you watched the Bills? Yeah, I have. I mean, Frazier has, he has a resume. Like, he has an absolute resume. He's been around. He's had top performing defenses. Biggest blemish was he was a horrible head coach in Minnesota. But, I mean, maybe that can be explained away. Um, All right. Well, anybody else have any other thoughts on this? Nope. All right. I'm getting a little nervous because uh, Jordan's supposed to be here now. Um, He's in the chat. I don't know where he is. Why is he not on? Why hasn't he signed on yet? Jordan, get in. Oh, there he is. Maybe he's having technical difficulties. There he goes. He wasn't letting me in to begin with earlier, so. I'm just going to remind everybody, if you like us, please hit that subscribe button in the bottom corner. Uh, Let your friends know about us. We have fun. We talk Texans. And we've got both Texans Thoughts and Patrick Storm here every week. You know, they're superstars in Texans Twitter. (laughs) And, of course, Jordan is on his own time. We are very appreciated when he's here. Um, I'm sure you've got questions. And maybe some answers. Got a lot of questions for us today. Hopefully, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Did you bring any casserole? Uh, I didn't, man. I didn't. Dang it. One time, next, once, eventually I'll come down to the H and we'll, we'll have a big meetup. We'll cook some casseroles for sure. And in, in, uh, in thought of Nick, I hope you'll like it. But we got a lot of questions today. Thank you guys. We got too many to answer on the pod. I cannot lie. So I'll get back to the rest of them on Twitter. But we're going to start off 
with where's the first one that I that I liked? Where'd it go? I lost it. My bad, y'all. One second. Um, where did it go? Okay. This is a good question. I like this one from Texan uh Texan Tears. We feel your pain, brother. But he says, How much leeway should the new defensive coordinator give Lonnie Johnson? Jonathan Grenard and Ross Blacklock, you know, some of the younger guys on the roster. What do you think about that, John? I would treat them all like they're rookies again. Hmm. I mean, honestly, like at this point, um, Lonnie Johnson, he gets a path because they throw him into a new position without, you know, any warning whatsoever. Yeah. And again, I stressed it before. It's kind of high. It's kind of hard to play high safety by yourself when you've never done it. They're expecting him to turn around, look towards the line of scrimmage, when he was a press man corner. So he has to flip his body around, read and react differently than he had previously, and also understand the way offenses work in a, in a different way. Like, yeah, he has the uh, obscene physicality to play that position. Like, he can do it, but it's going to take a little bit for him to learn it. And, I mean, granted, he did get a lot of snaps. I just didn't trust this coaching staff to properly treat him. And then Blacklock, again, you draft him for one reason. You talk him up all summer, like he's going to do one thing. And then the season happens and you ask him to do something else. Same problem. Even though he played the same position, he went from, you know, shooting gaps, probably playing a defensive end type position to being asked to control the line of scrimmage and maintain his gaps. Like what the hell (laughs) again, different body style, different play style, different way of reading and reacting. It's completely different. Even if he's lined up at the exact same position. And then Grenard, I I don't know. I thought it was injuries for why he didn't play. I don't really have an excuse for why he didn't really play other than the team is hopelessly devoted to Whitney Merciless, who has earned it, but he hasn't played up to it anymore. And at this point, Merciless should have been sitting behind Grenard. He really should have been. But it is what it is. I think new staff has to come in, give him more snaps, let them see if they can actually play. I hear you. I think I get your idea of treating them as rookies. I think I wouldn't go that far because I think with rookies, like you have to give them like two or three years, but I know where you're coming from. And I think definitely they deserve at least this next season, at least this next season to understand and learn from the new DC, what their role is going to be, what the new scheme is going to be. And, and basically they just need to have continuity, continuity at the same position, the same role so they can work out all the little kinks and improve and do the best job that they possibly can so we gotta have some patience with those young guys absolutely all right next question from rj yardbird he says if callan used to be leave casario leave casario b and let him do his job is it foolish to think we could see a short turnaround not next season obviously but pat do you think if cal he really takes this hands-off approach like we all want him to so let's casserole and the head coach let them be. Can we have a short turnaround? I think so. I think Nick is the type of guy that'll make the necessary moves. Um, he'll cut fat here, add some some talent there, and you know really get the ball rolling. Of course, if they get the right head coach. But I think yeah, Cal's got to take his his hands off of everything completely. Step back, go away. We'll see you in two years again. Um, Jack needs to go and be on the business side and fix whatever he can fix over there. And you know what? I, real quick, I want Jack to take the role. I don't know if anybody has ever seen the show Billions. If you've seen the show Billions and Bobby has this lady in the office and she's a therapist and all she's there to do is to motivate people to do their job better. That's all Jack needs to do. Yep. Go do that. Don't you don't be at practice. Just sit in your office and let them do their thing. Stay away. Let football players be football players. Let football coaches be football coaches. And you could be a motivational speaker and charge $500 an hour for your motivational speeches and leave my football team alone because I'm tired of it. But yeah, I think if those two guys can get their hands out of the mess, then uh, yeah, I think it could be a pretty quick turnaround. I hear you too. I think Castro, like a lot of people around the NFL really strongly believe in him and we do too. I'm personally, for me, he's grown on me a lot. Some of the moves that he's been making, I'm a, I'm a fan of it. So um, I think that, you know, if there's no obstructions in his way, 
And if we get the right head coach, like you said, if it does be Eric bien I think next season we could be in the playoffs. I really do believe it because just having Deshaun Watson alone will get you in every single game that you play, basically. Basically, right? And you get a little bit more luck next season. You get more better players at some certain positions and, and definitely playoffs should be very attainable. All right, Jordan, next question. question for you real quick. Hit me, hit me. Um, Eric bien if we hire him, are you happy or are we sad? Oh, I mean, oh, first super. off, first part of the question, do you think it happens? Second part of the question, happy or sad? First part, I definitely do think it happens. I think it's the only head coach hire right now that is going to keep Deshaun Watson in Houston. Um, well, I wouldn't say keep him in Houston, but keep him happy and want to play. Um, so I do think it's going to happen. And I think with all the negotiations that we've heard, they're they're at least close. And, and yeah, I know it's not finalized yet, but I do think it's going to happen. And will I be happy? Absolutely. Because... At the end of the day, he's been one of the top consensus guys. Maybe he's not your personal number one, but from a lot of people around the league, he's always been talked about as the top guy for the past two years now. He has the resume. He has the experience. He deserves his shot. And I think what he can bring to this team is what we need, a great offensive mind, a great leader of men. And yeah, I would be very, very happy. Do you think it's possible that he will turn down the position? (sighs) I think the only way he turns it down is if... Deshaun isn't fully on board, but from everything that we've heard, um, Deshaun likes the enemy. And so I don't think, I don't think the enemy would turn it out unless, unless the front office can't get off, can't stop falling on their own face and uh, making mistakes like that. But, and Pat, I, I wanted you to actually answer that. Do you think that there's a chance that the enemy turns down the position? No, because I think if this year, if he doesn't get the job that he's, like it's it's over. Like I think yep. this is his last chance, and not because he's not deserving of it. But if you interview for a position thirteen times and you don't get it, I think that just kind of the writing on the wall that it's just not going to happen. And so, I think unfortunately this is his last chance. Could very well be wrong. Steelers could fire Mike Tomlin next year. Somebody else, you know, else somebody else. You know, Joe Judge could get fired next year. I don't know. And he could land one of those jobs. But I think it's a, uh, I think this is his last chance. And I don't think he turns it down. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. All right. Let's keep it moving. John V, we got a question for you. Volta Matron. Um, he says, if you could have one position in the organization, what would it be and why? What are your strengths? I thought it was a fun one. Me? Um, well, I can't coach anything. I'm not qualified to be a general manager, so maybe Janice's job. <laughs> maybe uh, her job. for the top. Yeah. If you have the application for that, please send it to me because I will apply. Oh, if I had the application, two point five billion dollars. Yeah, if I had that much money, I would I would buy the team. But no, yeah, I I definitely can coach. I'll tell you that. Um, I'm not qualified to be a general manager. Maybe I would do scouting. I would do scouting. I would, I would like to be a director of scouting. That's a fun role. That's probably what I would try and what become as well. You have more qualifications than he does. What's the official title vice president of player development? Who? I couldn't hear you. Jack, you say, what's his official title? Vice president of player development, correct? Um, I think so. Let me check the bio. There, Hold on. there you go, John. I mean, John, you're more than qualified for that role. I mean, talking in front yeah, of people. Jack's there you go. You've got just as much qualification as he does, and you can't mess it up anymore. I'll be honest. I'm looking into it as a career, but yeah, give me Jack's or Janice's job. Or give me Am, Amy Palsik's job, PR. You're on PR. All right. You're shooting high. I like it. I like it. Um, let's move on to the next question though. Um, what do we got? Okay. Rise up says you can take any three head coaches from the league to fill these three roles, head coach, offensive coordinator, and defensive coordinator. John, what is your dream head coach OC and DC kind of trio? You can take anyone you want. Well, the head coach has to be Belichick. He's the only one that's going to be able to manage those egos. Uh, Kyle Shanahan as the offensive coordinator. Oof. And let's see the defensive coordinator, Pete Carroll. 
Put that. Ooh. Put those three in the same room. Belichick's the only one that's going to keep them under control. But I think that could be a pretty good coaching staff. I like that. I like that. It's a good all-star uh, studded lineup. I think I'd probably, I'd be pretty similar to you. I'd probably go Belichick as, as the head coach. Um, OC, I'd probably go Andy Reid. Instead, I think that, you know, he's just such an amazing mind. Kyle Shanahan, is, Shanahan obviously, he's a young guy, but I think with Reid's experience, already won a Super Bowl, I think that's definitely valuable there. DC, oh man, I got to go my guy, Brandon Staley. I got to give it to him. He's he's shown that he's been great, um, and I think you know if you got the experience with Belichick and Reed, Reed, then you can take a shot on a guy like Staley at DC. I like that. Ooh, all right. Mm, let's keep going. We got one from Will Fuller Fan Club. He says, "Should we focus on the interior offensive line during free agency or the draft?" Pat, do you think? I personally, I'd say both. But what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it really depends. I think it depends on who you're letting go if you're getting rid of both martin and fulton then you got to go both if you're only getting rid of one of them i think you got to go draft get younger because you've got a new coach coming in somebody that they can mold into what they want um and to build continuity with the guys that are going to play opposite of them already that are going to be here and and go that route. I don't. I think free agency this year, outside of Joe Thune, there's nobody that I really like. Um, that's going to be reasonably priced because I think this team has much bigger holes to fill if you're going to spend money on it. I think the draft would be the way to go. Yeah, I hear you on that for sure. Especially talking about kind of the the affordable thing, and and you know it's something we don't want to talk about. But right now, I think this year, like free agents, it's. We're not going to like attract the top dogs. Let's just be realistic with that. I don't think that's going to be the outcome. Um, teams are going to want to see that we're a functional and winning football franchise before they sign these big five, four or five year deals. So we have to look for those diamonds in the roughs, those guys who, you know, might want to take a one year prove it deal with us, um, play really motivated and then get paid later on. Um, so I hear you on that, but. Yes, sir. All right, let's go to another one. This one from at let's go Texans one. He says, Allen Robinson or Will Fuller. John V, I know you're a big Will Fuller guy. Are you still sticking with that take? Yeah. Will Fuller. I'm Will Fuller all the way. Let's see. If they're if you can give them the same contract, say they're they both be willing to take, I don't know, three years at seventeen million dollars a year. You still doing Fuller? Still going with Fuller. I'm not changing my mind on that. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I think that connection that D4 and, and Fuller have, it's it's hard to to just find that again in free agency. They built it up over years, so don't really want to let that go. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> this one from Art. He says, "Do you believe our interior offensive line will improve with another coach? Do we need to make Roderick Johnson a priority? Seems like he would do real well anytime he was in there. Yes, definitely he was. John, talk about talk about Mike Devlin and, and the low bar he's really really set. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um. Well, Devlin." I want his talent at being good at a job and not getting fired oh. or not being good at a job and not getting fired. Cause that is one thing that Devlin did prove. He is a survivor. I don't know of one guy other than Roderick Johnson that truly improved while he was playing here in Houston. And then, you know, Devlin also made some of my favorite quotes among them when he was talking about uh, Laramie Tunsil, that Laramie Tunsil he wishes could go and coach the guys. It's like, dude, you are the coach. Whatever Tunsil's doing that you want him to coach, you coach him. Like, that's your job. And just as much resources as we poured into the offensive line, it should have been better. Like, yep. I can guarantee the sharpening's going to be better with whomever we bring in. The tackles are fine. So it'll be center. Nick Martin. I mean, we pay him way too much, but he should be passable. He has shown flashes. He's just not consistent. And we don't also, you know, play in a way that is consistent to his strengths. And, um, well, Fulton, Fulton was just a speed bump this year and he probably is going to end up retiring, but he shouldn't be starting anywhere anymore. Like the game's just passed him by. So really maybe one person will change on the offensive line. So the coach will have to come in and he will have to fix it. 
and I am about 100% sure that there's not a worse coach out there for the offensive line. Like, there can't be. No. But we are Houston, and whenever you say something can't be worse, it can always be worse. <sighs> I hear you on that. I hear you on that. I think, yeah, with Devlin, there's just a lot of basic things that basic fundamentals that you saw with this offensive line that really did not help them out. Just little things like playing with poor pad level, um, not having good hand placement, just some little technical things. And even their inability to to pick up blitzes and stunts, stuff like that. Like that is all coachable. Um, where sometimes they just look completely lost, right? So I think the bar is so low. And the hashtag I've been using is hashtag DDWDD. Don't do what Devlin did. That's all. That's all we're asking. Just don't do what Devlin did. Don't rotate your left tackle like Chris Clark and Roger Johnson two years ago. Don't rotate your left guard like Max Sharping, Senio Calamente, and Brett Quavale. Just don't do that, please. Just teach them the basic fundamentals and get out the way. And that's all we're asking for. Well, Not what that was mind blowing to me is I've heard from multiple offensive line coaches growing up that run blocking is way easier than pass blocking. And yet, can't run block. We can't run block for shit, which is crazy with, like you said, the amount of investment that we put into this line. Two first round picks with Laramie Tunsil, another first round pick with Titus Howard, second round pick with Sharping, second round pick with Martin. That is that is like what the top offensive lines in the league invest into their O-line and they see the results. And so when you're seeing that talent is there, it's not the talent's fault. It's the coach. The coach has been here for the past Seven years of Bill O'Brien and haven't seen squat. So that's definitely when you know he's the issue. All right, we got one more here from free agent NFL fan. He says, do you think Duke and David Johnson are cut in order to make way for Mark Ingram and a rookie? I see a lot of hype around Mark Ingram um, now that the Ravens did recently cut him, Pat. What do you think about Mark Ingram and what do you think about David and Duke Johnson and the future on their team? I think it depends on who the head coach is going to be. If you bring in Eric Bieniemy, he's a running back guru, and we know this. He's proven it time and time again. Um, then, yeah, I would absolutely take a shot at Mark Ingram, but I'm not cutting Duke. I'd easily cut David Johnson, though. I think Duke, in a system with a, a back like Mark Ingram, where they would complement each other really well, um, would just be prolific for Deshaun. So I think, yeah, I would cut David, keep Duke, sign Mark. I hear you. I hear you. Mark Ingram is, he's that bruiser. He's that in-between the tackles runner. And like you said, that combo with Duke Johnson is what we saw with Carlos Hyde when we had one of our best rushing seasons, right? Um, so I think, you know, the whole talk about this, this season is, oh, you got two pass catching backs. We can also run it. So you have that kind of, um, what's the word, where you don't know what's going to come, right? But we saw that. It doesn't matter if you don't know what's coming if we can't actually do either of those well. Yeah. Right? So I'm, I'm with you on that. Hopefully Mike Ingram has still got it. I personally, I haven't watched many Ravens games, so I don't know if he's if age is catching up to him or not. It's interesting that he did get cut at the time that he did. Um, you know, Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins, I definitely would say they're better running backs than him. But running back is a position that, you know, you don't need to spend big on. That's what we're learning with the NFL. You don't need to spend big on it. So if Mark Ingram is willing to take a lower contract, maybe in a vet min contract to prove himself, I would be all, all for it. But that does it for me on the questions. Thank you guys for asking me. I'll get to the rest of them on Twitter. There were way too many for today, but appreciate y'all. And I'll hand it back to you, John. All right. Um, did we miss some breaking news or something? Chat's kind of going nuts about Deshaun Watson's Twitter. Oh, Lord. Deshaun's Twitter? No. no. George Springer has signed a six-year contract with the Toronto Blue Jays for $150 million. My heart. My heart. We're covering the that wrong sport. That hurts me because I'm a Red Sox fan, and now I have to play him multiple times throughout the season. And I know how good he is. So well, he definitely, be, definitely will be missed. For sure. Nothing on Deshaun. But really on Deshaun? I didn't see anything. Okay. I, we made our control in our chat, getting our hopes up. Nope. Okay. All righty. Well, I would like you all to kind of take notice that none of us are wearing Texans merchandise. As much as we love this team, we're all sitting here talking about the Texans. We are spending way too much of our free time talking about the Texans. Throwing it out there. Please support local 
um, local vendors in a way to kind of represent the H. Things like Running Game, things like Apollo um, 512. Again, follow me on Twitter, John A. Wade 3. I have a whole list. I'm going to pin it to the top of my profile. Don't buy anything from the Texans until, you know, this whole thing gets resolved. And if we're overreacting, great. But I would rather overreact and instead of, you know, possibly not do nothing and Deshaun leaves. Again, I want to thank everybody. Um, Jordan, you want to give your channel a shout out? Where can they find you? Sure. Yeah. Texans underscore thoughts on Twitter, just Texans thoughts on YouTube. Appreciate that. Uh, Pat, I don't know if I should follow you more. <laughs> um, yeah. Just follow me on Twitter at Patrick Storm TU. Um, like I said at the beginning of the show, I'm kind of taking I, I a little bit of a, a break from all the hoopla, but. You know, I still talk. It just depends on my mood. And Jambi, do you want to share where they can find you? Yep. Um, I'm at Sports of John B on Twitter and Instagram. All right. Again, thank you to everyone out in the chat. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. We will hopefully be back next week. We'll, we'll be a lot happier, right? Fingers crossed we're going to be happy next week, right? Come on. Okay. Go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Yeah.